Well, a warm welcome to you all. We have a very interesting story today. We're in uh, northeastern Victoria, in Jajurong, Yorta Yorta, and Tangarong countries. Um, but before we hear that story, um, I'd just like to thank the subscribers or supporters who have given to us uh, over the last several weeks so that we can make these stories or share these stories. And uh, also just a reminder, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Um, you'll find uh, the subscribe tab in the top right corner of the website. So um, here we are in your studio, Angie. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, and we are with Eric and Mandy. And tell us how you know each other. I think we, Angie and I met at the gallery, <coughs> first gallery, wasn't it? Um, when I worked for Shepherd and for, you Art was at Museum. Shepherd and Art mm. Museum, yeah. Mm. And the gallery had just started that at that time. And I think uh, it was Mandy's uncle actually that actually started the gallery. Mm. And I think Mandy, you come along six years, six, seven years later. Something yeah, like that. 2015. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So it started in 206, I think, wasn't that's it? Right, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And are you all artists? What are, What are your yeah. different roles? Um, so yeah, I come from a fine arts background mm -hmm. and um, studio artist. Hadn't really worked for anybody else until I worked for the Shepherd and Art Gallery at that point mm -hmm. um, in education. Uh, so yeah. Arts administration certainly was never on my radar. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, there we have it. Mm. Yeah. And you, Eric? Is the... I, was, um, mm. I was painting. I was an artist at that time. Mm -hmm. um, I've been doing that well before the gallery had opened, actually, um, just starting out. Um, and that took me further, the gallery did, so within the arts. And, yeah. yeah. And you, Mandy? Is... No, not at all. Yeah. Uh, brothers and sisters that are, must have went over me. <laughs> so <laughs> so your, your role in, in, the, in the organisation that you all work, work in, what, what has that been? Um, finance, mm -hmm. mainly, mm -hmm. getting the bills paid and all that sort of stuff. Um, mainly background work. Well, I like to be in the background. Yeah. But if there was an exhibition or anything like that, well, then we all had multiple mm. roles. Yeah. yeah. So you can't really pinpoint one, but yeah. that was the main one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So prior to um, 2013, or no, 15, 16, may even, uh, that Eric, Mandy, and I were the only employees. Right. Mm -hmm. of, of the... Of the organisation. Yeah. And what's that called? Okay, so um, it's Kayla Arts mm -hmm. and uh, it was a fully funded, um, federally and state funded Aboriginal Arts Centre running along the same, uh, in the same model as uh, Central and Top End Art Centres. Mm -hmm. So there to support Aboriginal artists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's your role, Eric? Uh, my role was the uh, curator mm -hmm. in front of house. Um, so interacting with the community and the artists, uh, doing a lot of the talks to groups that come in there. Mm. And yeah, that was, that was a lot. Mm. Mm. And your, your role? Um, I, mm. My role was um, arts business manager. Right. So um, my responsibility was to liaise between um, the operations of the gallery and the board but also to manage the operations, to manage the artistic program, um, apply for funding and manage the staff and employment, HR, finance. Mm. Yeah. And what, um, in the lead up before the pandemic, which changed so many of our lives, um, how would you, each of you, describe that organisation? Like, how, how, like, what is your, your feeling around that? Good. Um, comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, you wanted to go, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, wanted to go there and do what you do. Um, I think the three of us was, was, was feeling the same that way. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it always, it was, it was a good mood all the time, laughing, mm. you know, having a dig at each other every now and again. Mm -hmm. uh, all yeah, the time. It was all good. <laughs> yeah. 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 It was. And the sole purpose um, to elevate Indigenous art in the area. Yeah, it was all Absolutely. for the local artists yeah. or, or in the area. Yeah. So probably probably artists from, uh, say, a Chuk, as far as a Chuk, I reckon. And a few of our artists moved away. So we, we still kept in contact with those. So we were still supporting them. And yeah, so it was mostly about the local artists. Mm. And how did the organisation grow or develop? What was it? What, what has been its trajectory? Um, <clears throat> we we grew very quickly. Um, it started under the umbrella of what is now the Kale Institute, um, and we became independent in two thousand and ten and uh, moved into a double shop front in the main business area in Shepparton. And from there, we, we grew very, very rapidly, um, simply through having that Main Street exposure. And suddenly people started to realise, well, mm. there were Aboriginal people in this area creating art. And um, so um, we were then um, asked by council who were then planning on building a new museum, art museum, if we would, would be a tenant in the new museum. Uh, so from 2015 to uh, 2021, yeah. we were sort of working on that trajectory of scaling up, but not just up in size, up in quality of artwork and also um, really working on our brand and also um, working on building our brand nationally and internationally. So mm. we had, um, we worked really hard to sort of get ourselves to the um, Aboriginal Art Fair three years running. Mm -hmm. um, Where was that? In Darwin. We had a couple we went to then. We went three. to one in Sydney as well. Yeah. Mm. And the mm. Black Arts Market there, which was good. Yeah. So um and and we were liaising with um with the likes of spacecraft in in um in Melbourne and moved into sort of screen printing fabrics and uh into fashion um since we have been sacked one of the dresses that was designed and printed at Kayla Arts ended up in Paris. Mm. Um so we really felt, and, and then we were taking on more staff, and I think at the time when we no longer had a job, the biggest disappointment for us was that we felt like we were just really kicking goals and we were about yeah. to launch a really big exhibition. Yeah. Um, we were doing a film project. Um, it was just, it was really good, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was all, mm. all moving further. Mm. Before we get to the sacking, because that's a big story, mm. I just wonder, Mandy, do you want to um, mention, I think it was your an uncle of yours or a, a relation who uncle was... Uncle Les Saunders. Yeah. Do you want to tell about his story and the origins of, of the, of the organisation? One day we were sitting at the Aboriginal Medical Centre mm -hmm. in Marupana and um, the CEO at the time, who was out the back having a smoke, and she asked him, would he do some surveys? Go around to Aboriginal houses and do some surveys. So he said he'd think about it. And then I don't know what happened after that. Well, he ended up going around to people's houses and he started noticing art on their walls. And he thought, In this their is cupboards, all, under yeah, their beds, yeah, everywhere. All going yeah. to waste. Mm. So then the next step, I don't know what it was, well, the next step, he um, approached the managers of uh, the the, K, the Institute yeah. uh, it was before their time um, to start an art gallery for the local Indigenous artists out in the community. And um, I think we started off with about six different artists and it just grew and grew. So we 
we really need we was running out of space at that little little space that we had I think it was only about as big as this area yeah. wasn't it yeah. so it wasn't that big and we was having put things away in the you know in cupboards out the back so I think we was looking for a bigger space at that time then but yeah it was just what he what he realized a lot of the community had had art at home in the cupboards put away on the walls so he decided wanted to start up a gallery to help them and get their art out there mm, but so yeah. it went from there really and, yeah. and it just yeah. sort of it grew and more artists <coughs> seen that and les saw that you know more was out there and mm. you know and and the more or less project sort of went bigger went as far as the chuka mm. and we was getting artists to bring their stuff to us then so mm. it just grew mm. yeah. we ended up with about 82 Mm. So it started with six artists back in yeah, 2000. 2006, six, six. yeah. Wow, yeah. and to representing that yeah. two artists, mm. wow. I think I was one of the mm. one of the artists there at that time as well. Yeah. He asked me to do things with him and... He, pushed um, you into it. <laughs> yeah, pushed me into yeah. it. You talked to them and so I was doing a lot of the talking for him and, you know, and helping him exhibit stuff here and there. At different functions and you know um, stalls, we had we had a few different stalls. I remember coming down to um, Mitchelton Winery. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. That was Les and I, I drove first, um... drove a few of the art pieces down here and had a big exhibition, helped him set up. And mm. it was always me and him doing it. Yeah. So yeah, it was. Um, so it was a natural progression to becoming curator. Um, he pushed me oh, into it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It sounds like you were doing it anyway. Yeah, I, I was. I, I loved. I just loved helping him, you know, yeah, because yeah. Um, he was like a big brother to me. You know, he was sort of, I'll help you, you know, and I'll help you, yeah. and uh, just come and get me. Yeah. And that's where he pushed me. You talk to them now, yeah. and yeah, she, he he got me to talk to a lot of people. So I think that's how why I talk to a lot of people now yeah. in different ways. So. Yeah. yeah, it's his fault. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then in about 2017, he passed away. Mm. 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 It sounds like the centre is, um, yeah, in part a legacy of the, the three of your work, but his as well. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so this sounds like an incredibly positive story in terms of um, indigenous culture having a place yeah in this area mm. um, then COVID hit mm. and what happened then yeah so um we I mean I think it was you know first the the masks and all of that sort of thing so um, yes we did all the right things and complied and uh, then the lockdowns Mm. It so, started to feel uncomfortable at that time when yeah. it started to hit then. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't like it was before that. Yeah, so mm. we um, we then, of course, were closed down for some time. Mm. Um, we had prior to that uh, really hurried up a project that we had going, getting new computer hardware so that everybody had a laptop and mm. could work from home or take it home and that sort of thing. So we had that capacity. Um, and we bought some film equipment and things like that. So um, the question was, how do we keep supporting the artists during lockdown? Because a lot of them it was generating income for one, but also more importantly, that social aspect of being able to come together. And uh, so that became our topic of conversation as, as staff as mm. to how to how would we do that? Yeah. Um, so we devised lots of different ways. We did films with uh, tutorials and then we would actually go in. This We had a roster and some people would be on site with the doors closed. And One put, or two people mm, in at a time. Put yeah. together packs yeah. 
for artists and then go and deliver them to their houses, mm -hmm. go back, pick up the artwork. Um, click we, and collect. Click and collect. <laughs> yeah. We had, um, we very quickly got our online gallery and pay portal mm -hmm. sorted. We had a trajectory like most people like mm. that with our mm. digital yeah. capabilities. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, we did a heap. We, I think we were busier mm. in, in yeah. many ways during that lockdown period because mm. we were, if we weren't on site doing stuff like that, we were actually busy getting, you know, applying for grants or doing reporting or whatever, but also talking to one another as we were each doing our work, you know, mm. I think it was, it was almost like having someone there in the office mm. with you. Mm. Um, so that's how we sort of got through that. And also we were at the point of moving into the new museum. So we had to pack up the whole collection workshop right. well not just a collection right. because it wasn't just a gallery it was a studio as well mm. so artists would come in there and work um so we had all the art materials the everything the infrastructure yeah. all, all the artwork all to pack up mm. so we managed to do that in lockdowns as well mm. um right. so it was really really busy and really even though it was uncomfortable and as horrible as it was for most other people, we were really focused mm. on how we how we make the most of that time. Yeah. Sounded yeah. like you adapted pretty well. Yeah, mm. yeah. And then um, things changed for a lot of people when the mandates came in. How did that affect your organisation? Mm. So um, pretty hard, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 As the manager. Um, I was um, responsible for employment and, you know, hirings and firings and all the rest. So, you know, Mandy and I were the HR department. Mm -hmm. um, there were a lot of discussions and gnashing of teeth. Um, but in the end, I wrote a letter uh, to the staff um, that had, that outlined the chief health officer's um, mandate um, and I also put in a whole lot of links to fair work, to work health and safety, um, a few links to cases that had, were being heard at the time. Um, what sort of cases? There was a case in, the, uh, in fair work where a woman had been um, denied employment for not getting a flu vaccination. Um, she didn't win, but it, what was of interest was one of the magistrates or one of the, what are they called, um, his comments um, stating uh, our human right to um, to make our own decisions in terms of what, right. what goes on in our own bodies. And basically he supported her, her case. I put... Some things of interest there. My mm -hmm. my aim in doing that was to um, give people information, and not simply to say, "Well, this is the mandate." Um, so to balance, know, the... I'm coming down hard, yep. and this is what's yep. going to happen. Yep. Sure. Um, so what I mm -hmm. then asked each staff member to do was to meet with me privately to discuss further um, how we would go forward. Um, and at that point, uh, oh, we'd had lots of discussions, hadn't yeah. we, in the, we over did, lunch and had a few meetings about mm, it and talk, and more, more, more yarns about it. I suppose not yeah. so much meetings. Yeah, you know what what each of us thought about mm. it and what was your initial um, reaction to that? My initial reaction was um, no way. You know, yeah. Yeah. I could say the rest, but I won't. Um, <laughs> um, because only because I, I've, I've just had it that uh, it was a it was a bad heart attack actually, and got three stints in, in my heart. And before COVID, was it? Or? It was just before yeah. it. Yeah, and I was I wasn't really having any any part of it, no needle or anything, because. Um, I've just had all this happen to me, and 
I was thinking, no, no, it was stopped me in my tracks, really, actually. Mm. I, I never thought of anything else. No, I'm not getting it, that's it. Because mm. of um, all the stories you're hearing, too, about people with heart yeah. issues and. But even, all even, that. even before the stories that I heard, I thought, no, nah, I don't like needles anyway, and I've just had, had this heart attack. <laughs> mm. You know, and once I heard different stories, well, I'm definitely not going to get one, mm. you know, so, yeah. The messaging from government to First Nations people was pretty strong, wasn't it? Your communities seemed to be signalled out for yeah. special attention. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I actually thought, well, we're not, not so special as the next person, mm. you know, uh, we can still get it or we don't get it. Mm. Um, but uh, I suppose everyone's to their own thinking. Mm. And that was my thinking anyway. You know, I wasn't going to get it anyway. Yeah. Um, it's just going to make me worse. Well, that's right. And I was scared because about 20 years ago, I had the flu needle mm -hmm. and I got that sick. And then when I got better, I went back to the doctor and he said, you were going to get the flu anyway. And I didn't think nothing of it. And then as this has come about, I thought, maybe I did have a reaction to just the flu needle. Mm. And I thought, no. Nah. Mm. Mm. And then yeah. I had a um, sister-in-law. She was sick. She had multiple things wrong. And she thought, I have to go get this needle because I won't get no pension no more. And so she got her first one and she never felt right. So what was it about? Is it six weeks or? Yeah, six weeks, something like that. She went back after. and got the second one. A week later to the day, had a heart attack in bed. Mm. So that and really not, made mine and passed away. And passed away. Mm. Mm. So that made my mind up. Mm. Yeah, so I suppose as, you know, yeah, it was pretty stressful, wasn't it? Because yeah. we really talked about all sorts of ways to deal with it. Um, and as far as we could see was that, um, you know, the, the orders were about, well, if, if you weren't, didn't get this needle, um, that you weren't allowed on site. And we still aren't allowed on site. <laughs> <laughs> we can go to the door. <laughs> can we? And, um, I don't know. So, um, yeah, I was sort of pretty much waiting to see what would happen. Um, I certainly wasn't about to go and get it. I don't do needles at all for any reason. Um, but then, um, as happens, you know, there we... There are those people who then decide that they need to um, be a police officer. And we had one of those on staff. Um, we had a couple of those. Mm, yeah. um, who then went to the board and basically said, you know, that I wasn't doing the right thing and um, that they should come in and pull rank, mm, yeah. which they did. Pretty, and pretty underhandedly in some mm. ways. Mm. You know, my first contact with the board was not official. It was a member of the board who I regarded as a long-term friend um, rang me to seek my personal views on the um, whole thing, and which I gave. Um, and then that was later conveyed to the rest of the board and used as ammunition against me in, in a professional mm -hmm. sense. Um, so, yeah, that was pretty hurtful mm -hmm. and pretty shocking. Um, basically, <laughs> they told us that we were to leave the site, um, that, that we were to close the gallery and uh, we were not none of the staff were to come back into the gallery under any circumstances unless they had proof that they had been vaccinated. So mm. this was within, like, we were given the end of the day on the day that yeah. they decided this. So no sort of thought about what about 
anybody else. Uh, what about what do we do with everything we've got in train, you know? And Was this yeah. around October? If, if when yeah, October, October. November, yeah, it was. Before yeah. the enforcement. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Mandate, right? Yes, it was before yeah. the enforcement. Right. And you three are the main staff members, is that right? Yes. Um, we the senior ones. ones. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the senior ones. Yeah, yeah. so we had um, also a, a, an education officer um, and also a marketing person. And then we had um, four, four? Yeah, we have, yeah, we have four. Other young, well, youngish employees who Trainees. had been employed under the Working for Victoria scheme. Um, of which we had funding for, um, and they were the Aboriginal people, and it was a training situation. So um, they were completely thrown into disarray. And at the time we got this directive, you know, I I had been in discussions with with the state government about about how I deal with them, and what happens with the funding and, or, and they couldn't answer any of my questions. In fact, we were extremely uncomfortable with any of it. Mm. Had uh, We know nothing. <laughs> mm. So, and that was sort of the answer I kept getting from every, you know, funder or anybody that we had a contract with uh, when I sought information, well, as far as you're concerned in terms of mm. this, this and this, how do we deal with it? So, mm. yeah, it was all pretty chaotic everything like we were just in the middle of also bringing all our staff up to date with all work health and safety <laughs> training and mm. new policies and stuff we were just in the midst of doing all that so mm. we were really right across what was required with work health and safety mm. and um you know so this didn't make any sense it, it, it was completely nonsensical within that context mm. it, it just flew in the face of everything if you're talking about government and what government puts out there you know um in terms of you know the importance of social social interaction and um all our funding was given to us on the basis of you know social and economic mm. inclusion um <laughs> you know uh, the whole organization was set up as a reconciliation project in action because on the board was aboriginal people and non-aboriginal people employed were aboriginal people and non-aboriginal people mm. we we sought to bring we classed ourselves as and often spoke about ourselves as a cross-cultural bridge yeah so all of that just suddenly was it evaporated. Well, it's ironic, isn't it, that <laughs> you then become segregated from your own um, organisation? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. how, how did, Mandy, how did that make you feel? Like a kick in the guts. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Because yeah. I really love working there, especially because of Uncle Les. And mm. I wanted it to keep going because of him. Mm. <clears throat> But now, it'll probably just go down the Google. Mm. Yeah, it's too hard to explain. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Getting angry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I felt that same too. Um, I wanted, I, I would have liked to see it go further for less. Um, because we came, we came so far with that, with the uh, whole gallery. And we, we grew so much. Um, and, and his spirit was always there. Mm. You can feel it there, you know. Um, won't feel it now. Mm. Yeah, so it's hard. Mm. Mm. Before the mandates, what was your relationship like with the board? We didn't really see the board, right. actually. Yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. I forgot we even had one. <laughs> um, yeah, we um, we hardly saw them. Yeah, um, it was always us. <laughs> yeah. You know, if a uh, exhibition come up, one or two of them might might turn up. Yeah. You know, um, if something uh, positive for the gallery had happened, one or two might turn up. We wouldn't see 
very rarely see them anyway. So that yeah. must feel like a double kick in the guts. Yeah, it does. Have built something. It and does, then yeah. Have... And then they come swooped in. Yeah, because they were, each, each of those members of the board were chosen by the gallery community, you know, um, and then, but they were never around when they should have been, you know, and and when when things got hard for them, that's when they turn turn up. They were, well, you can't do this because of this. Um, to us, that wasn't right. I think no, to me, it wasn't right because where were you? You know. Mm. Do you think they would say they were just following orders? Yeah, that, that's, that's what, what they, they are. That's what they are saying. Um, we're just following the orders what we are supposed to. Mm. Um, you know, what orders are those? <laughs> well, as it you know, as it turns out, they really didn't follow the orders. Um, you know, way. well, my reading of those orders were that. You know, if you weren't fully vaccinated, you couldn't come on site, but that that they needed to investigate mm. all possible ways to um, to keep people employed, whether that's working from home or, or other inventive ways. Mm. Now, um, I think we had, after their first letter, oh, I can't remember, they spent so many letters because we kept responding to them as, as a full staff. Mm. So... Um, less one <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and we stuck to the uh, their request to not go on site um, and we had a couple of picnics and together and to talk about well what's our response and uh, one of the letters that we wrote back was outlining ways in which we could um, keep the gallery afloat because we knew very well that because at that time there were five of us mm. that were not going to get the injection. We knew very well that the board had absolutely no idea how the gallery ran. Um, they didn't have access to the finances, to the bank. They didn't have access to HR. They didn't have, they didn't understand anything about the operations. So that if we were no longer there, mm. the, the, it would be chaotic. So we put forward a whole range of ways that we could do this. Mm -hmm. And even to, if they wanted new staff on site, we could train them online. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it wasn't just a simple method of doing a handover of an A4 sheet because it was a complex mm -hmm. operation. Yeah. Um, and they just blatantly said no. Mm -hmm. There was no discussion. There was no willingness to enter into that discussion it was just you don't get the job you've got no job basically and what's happened to the center now well as far as we know that don't know we can't go there <laughs> they've never yeah. been able to yeah. go in as customers you can't yeah. cross the threshold yeah. Yeah. can't go through them doors so yeah. as far as we know it's it's not going it's open it's open but yeah. you know not like it was yeah but when you talk to the community um, they don't like the feel of it anymore. Um, some want their art out of there. Mm -hmm. Some have taken their art yeah. out, actually. Um, one of one of the young blokes, uh, artists, he's moved, got all his art out and moved to Melbourne. A um, couple of the younger artists have taken it, wanted to take theirs out and not have anything to do with the gallery um, because of us three not there. Um, no mentor there, no one to really, you know, put them in the way and, and support them. Mm. Um, I think that's the main thing that they, why they've taken it out, their artwork, because there is no real support it's for It's because we're not there. Mm. <laughs> but, you know, just on it's that, true. Well, it's just on, yeah, yeah. It? Yeah. on that, when they finally gave us our marching orders, which, which took, a little bit of time but because there was this backwards and forwards communication um but they took eric because eric is an artist as well in his works on the walls they took all his work down and put it in the back put it in the back room in the storeroom so it's taken 
a lot of effort and phone calls and all the rest of it. Finally, it's only what three weeks ago you yeah. got you got his art back. Mm. So it wasn't on there f being sold. He was not able to derive any economic benefit from it because it wasn't on the walls and so it was just blatant punishment mm -hmm. and, and they're still um, using his face as yeah. the face of the gallery mm. how do you feel about that i want my face down <laughs> <laughs> i want i want my face off the website i want it um you know i just don't want it there don't feel right to be there if i'm not there and you know um they, go, they need to do something about that. Yeah, so from someone who's just hearing your story, what I'm getting the impression is that for many years, you've grown this organization from very grassroots, um, from a little seed, and you've created a forest. And it's a jungle now because <laughs> our, a lot of our artists' artwork has gone worldwide. Mm -hmm. You know, and countrywide, and a lot of people know Kayla Arts. Um, when we go to Darwin Arts Fair, a lot, a lot of people from there, oh, yeah, you from Victoria, you're Kayla Arts, you know. Um, I've heard of you. Oh, where you come from? Top of Australia. Oh, wow. So, you know, it's it's a jungle. There's so many people that don't even see that we're in segregation still. Yeah. That the yeah. mandates still are affecting many households. Yeah. Like just just because that's another layer, isn't it? That's I think it to, for me it's it's culturally uh, heartbreaking because as because as a, as an artist, an Aboriginal artist, um, it's harder for me at home doing my art um, where it was with the gallery. A lot of people can see me art. They came into the gallery, and with other Aboriginal artists as well, who, who um, are in the same situation as myself as an artist. Um, it sort of, I sort of stopped doing it, but I've started picking it back up again. So my spirit is getting picked up by doing my art again. So, you know, I think it, it'll be the same with other Aboriginal artists that way mm. it's culturally heartbreaking mm -hmm. yeah. I, th I think the thing that gets me is that um, the, the discussion you know general sort of discussion and mainstream messaging at the moment is around you know that the pandemic's finished and, um, is it finished? Well, I mean, there's more people <laughs> supposedly have got it. No, um, yeah. Not all of this sort of stuff <coughs> and people that have had the jab have got, got the disease. Um, but that's the, the main messaging now. It's done, you know, oh, through the pandemic. It's, it's in past tense. Yet you've got a whole... And, and I think we are in great numbers. We're in greater numbers than than we would think because we all have been segregated from one another yeah but um it's not over if the effect and it's not the pandemic it's the orders we're not over um so yeah there's a great many of us that still don't have uh the income that we had uh don't have the i guess the professional associations that we once had um and don't have the social interaction that we once had. And so you've had to sort of do this, you know, 2020, 20 so it's reconfiguring within our, within our uh, employment, but then now we've got to reconfigure again outside of that, that network, you know, so. You make um, another circle. And, and well, and, and, and make another, how do you make a living, you know, mm. and do all of that. So it's, it's about, you know, you've jumped, <laughs> you've jumped numerous times, but also again with what you're talking about, with some of the the vitriol in terms of if people know that you haven't gone and had this procedure, um, that you are like a leper, that you you you're the disease. Um, 
So yeah, it's the, just bizarre. The social stigmatization yes. yeah. is completely unwarranted and completely unscientific, but yet it's been the permission to be discriminatory mm. has been fanned quite aggressively, yeah. hasn't it? Absolutely. Are you now? I mean, that's your that your workspace. There's division, but what about your own um, friendship or community circles? Has that been a, a, a has that division continued into those spaces? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, family and that. Yep. They absolutely. Don't want to know you anymore. Mm. Or don't want to come near you. Mm. I'd rather stay home, talk to my plants anyway. <laughs> I hate going out now because I'm just. So over it. Mm. And I like talking to these two and this lovely lady named Anna. Mm. Call her Mama Duck. <laughs> well, we're we're going to hear from Anna in a minute. Yes. Um, <laughs> but she's an interesting part of mm. your story. Absolutely. Big part yeah. of ours. Huge. Yeah. Mm. Do you want to just talk about Anna's role before we hear from her? Like how that, what that's meant to, you, to the three of you? Mm. Um, yeah, well... Um, I guess I sort of started to build a little bit of an online community um, which was growing, you know, sort of hooking up with people who are of, of the same ilk and, um, and um, a friend called Jasmine rang me one day and said, there's this woman called Anna, she's coming to, she's, she's, she's got something to offer us in terms of um, this, all this sacking and stuff, do you want to come to this meeting? And so. I, Yep, I'm there. <laughs> and so Mandy and I went and met Anna um, with some other people. And um, and then we pursued her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, and she's been such a um, strength to us, helping us navigate the whole, you know, fair work thing of talking to us and explaining to us um, the whole process. And of course you think fair work oh yeah they're the people that are meant to help you when things are not fair <laughs> and um yeah but they are not there to help us that's what you found that's what we found mm. but yes do you, do you all feel that yeah yeah mm. you know if you know i've often i've thought in the last few months you know if we had have taken the complaint that we took with Anna to Fair Work say three years ago our employer would have been absolutely hauled over the coals demoralized fine all the rest of it mm. but not now now we're the problem where mm. we were at fault we were the ones that did the wrong thing so they made it very clear. Well, you take what you deserve. You made the you made the choice. You had a choice. Mm. Either have a physically non, um, you know, a permanent medical procedure that you can't reverse, or you have no job. Mm. What's the problem? Mm. All you had to do was just make the right decision. Mm. That's really what came back. We were at a protest and I saw a, uh, a, a protest sign that said, not forcing you, just taking away your rights mm. until you comply. Mm. And really that's what we've been through. Yeah. And a lot of people are gung-ho, ready to take it. That's fine. I've got no interest. I'm sure you don't have any interest in other people's medical, private medical no. choices. So that seems to be the, the, the issue here, doesn't it? Absolutely. That, that, yeah, that it's an encroachment on the autonomy of a being. Mm -hmm. And yet it's not port reported that way. It's you are selfish. You are, mm. you are p bringing harm potentially mm. to people. Mm. We've just come from Liz Mann's home, not far from here and she is vaccine injured. Uh, well, she will tell that story, it's not up to me to tell that story, but we, we are sharing that story. Mm. But, the, but the short of it is Liz um, didn't want to take it, took it, mm. and has ended up with heart, 
complications, mm. um, which is exactly why you didn't want to take it, Eric. That's mm. right. Yeah. So it's, it's so interesting in the same day, we find about two stories that are very interrelated. And um, yeah, and you know, to hear Lisa's story where she is really so regretful, she wishes she could take back that decision. Mm. I guess I knew that now we're after fair work, after none of us getting any joy out of that. And in fact, you know, with, with Eric's um, um, hearing, um, Anna was prevented from um, representing him after she'd represented Mandy and I. And um, so, you know, that in itself speaks volumes. But uh, so, yeah, we're yeah. now taking it to the federal court. So again, you know, we wouldn't be in this position of um, empowerment and feeling safe to do this um, if, it, if it wasn't for Anna and her support and the support of, of her lawyer. Um, so we're, we're intrepidly going where none of us have been before. Um, as to what happens next, we've got no clue. Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> well, thank you, each of you, for having the courage and the generosity to share your story because these stories need to be told. And yeah. I think it's time that they're not buried and they're mm. not disappeared from view. And yeah, so, so appreciate you giving your time today. Mm, thank you. Yeah, Probably thank what you, I would you. just like to say in terms of, I, I hope that this story um, reaches people who are, because people are still losing their jobs mm -hmm. now um, and will be going to the places where we've been. Um, and more people need to do that. The more people that actually take it up and push back. So I hope this encourages some people to have the courage to find someone to help them push back. Um, lest we all feel totally like victims, because we're not. We're powerful, sovereign beings, and uh, we need to take that in our own hands. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Thank Mandy. you. Thank Cheers. you. So before we talk about uh, your coming together mm -hmm. with these guys, do you want to just paint a picture about your background and what, where you have come from culturally in terms of COVID and where we've been in the last 12 to 24 months? Yep, sure. Um, so I'm German by background and I'm an immigrant to Australia. Um, I came to Melbourne as a 15 year old and so completed my schooling here um, and then have gone on to study and study on several occasions in diff different fields. Um, and at the moment I'm a doctoral researcher. Um, so I'm finishing my doctorate at a well-known university in Melbourne and um, I have gone into the field of history. And I think part of why I've gone into studying history, specifically Latin American and Caribbean history, is that thirst for knowledge about um, how injustices um, have taken place, such as genocide, etc., which is very, very relevant to me as a German person. Um, I'm married to a German man who um, has come out eight years ago from, from Germany and whose family um, has lived through extremely traumatic events in during the Second World War. And so we are acutely aware of um, the catastrophes that can take place when um, governments uh, take on a uh, totalitarian or a um, uh, top-down, very authoritarian approach to managing populations um, throughout history and um, so this background I believe also play, plays into why alarm bells started ringing for me when um, 
throughout the lockdowns, but also in the way they were implemented, the way they were targeted towards particular ethnic groups, in my view. But then when talk started to happen about um, vaccinations and the way that this was going to be enforced upon people. Before we uh, get to the story regarding Mandy and Eric and Angie, the the mandates, did they have they affected you? Personally? Yes, they have very, very deeply. Um, so for me personally, um, at university, um, I'm not welcome on campus. I'm not welcome to attend the library. So a lot of, as a historian or a budding historian, um, it's very important for me to be able to access archives, libraries. These are the tools of my trade. And I'm not welcome because I have refused to provide private medical documentation. And um, also the segregation of people who think differently, who either are openly unvaccinated um, out of the vaccine closet, uh, or people who simply feel that this is not an appropriate topic for discussion um, and that the decision of whether to be vaccinated or not is a private one. Um, this has become highly, highly controversial, particularly amongst um, university circles. And there is a huge amount of shame attached to not going with the general group that I've been a part of for 13 years or so. Mm. Yeah. And that has really, really broken my heart. Yeah. You can imagine that it would be a very different thing if these injections stop transmission. And, but even then, mm. it's still a body autonomy thing, isn't it? It is. And I think mm. for me, having really had a lot to do with the law in my studies. So I look at um, US constitutional law. I look at constitutional law generally. I look at Bill of, Bills of Rights um, because of the particular area of the Caribbean that I study that had tried to gain sovereignty, political sovereignty in the 20th century. Um, I feel that the human rights implications of um, enforcing, the state enforcing any invasive medical procedure is problematic regardless of whether the treatment has been comprehensively proven safe and efficacious for the majority of people. Even then, there is a huge ethical problem, even if we accept that a single person might die or be injured as a result of an enforced treatment. I, I absolutely do not agree with that. Yeah. Mm. How did you mm. hear about KLA Arts oh, and the and this the particular sacking, case? And the sacking, yeah. Basically, um, there was rumblings through the community. So I live in country Victoria, and there were great rumblings of people starting to cotton on in about August or September 2021 mm -hmm. that something far more repressive was going to happen. People didn't want to believe it, but there was a feeling that um, because people thought this cannot be. The Australia that we know would not uh, behave in an oppressive manner. And so people didn't know whether to take it seriously or not, but there was a feeling, there was a great deal of anxiety and fear that um, they may be forced into this medical decision. So I joined a community meeting that was put on by a wonderful local woman and Angie and Mandy were there. Um, and at that stage, I'd been researching um, the law, uh, legislation, and I'd already been working with about 20 or 30 people that came to me from a particular industry, the aviation industry, through a friend of mine that were all being put through disciplinary proceedings regardless of medical exemptions and they were being sacked. So when I came to that meeting and I met um, Angie and Mandy, um, I was already speaking a very uh, clear legal language of what I had learned and they seemed to connect with that. 
Yeah. And you've worked in universities before teaching uh, around the areas of informed consent. Do you yes. want to talk about that? Absolutely. So um, mm. for four years, um, up until 2018, I worked for the Department of Medical Education at the University of Melbourne in a very special and very important program called the Clinical Teaching Associate Program, which on the uh, women's health side, so we had men's health and women's health. Basically, um, I was part of a small group of women who are called lay medical teachers. Mm -hmm. And we were trained quite comprehensively to teach uh, women's um, health exam techniques and to also have those techniques demonstrated and performed on ourselves. And as part of that, we taught informed consent. Mm -hmm. And so I taught with this group of women uh, for Melbourne University at all of the teaching hospitals in Victoria. Mm. To, to, because every undergraduate medical student in Victoria has to pass through that program. And I taught a lot of students in that time and I learned, and in order to teach it, I had to be completely aware of what is the meaning of informed consent. In terms of mandates, is, is there informed consent? No, there cannot be. So one of the first things that I did in light of what I already knew was um, actually talk to uh, my local GP who then put me onto the ATAGI guidelines. So that's the um, Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation. And it sets out very clearly that um, informed consent must be given um, for any medical procedure, especially one that's invasive to the body, so one that penetrates the skin. And that informed consent means that A, it's informed, so you're told about the risk benefit analysis, mm -hmm. you're told about the potential side effects, um, you're told about, uh, hopefully about, if you wish to know, the list of ingredients in what's going to be injected, if it's a medical injection, and that you then have a chance to give your consent to that procedure free of any undue pressure or influence. So as soon as I heard about a mandate which ties um, your livelihood your social standing, your integration socially into the workplace to this idea that you are being told you either consent to this or else any kind of negative consequence if you do not consent makes the idea of that consent an oxymoron. So that was instantly where my mind went as soon as I heard of this novel concept of a state government mandate and then there are other layers such as you know how does that actually potentially conflict with a federal legislation mm. um yeah so i thought i'm not able to give informed consent and nobody else can either and that brought home to me the what i felt was a catastrophe in the making yeah. Science is built on questions. Absolutely. Otherwise, it's not science. Yeah. As someone who has gone to university and really believed wholeheartedly in the idea of fostering critical thought. So I've tutored undergraduate students um, under the supervision uh, of historians. And we were not there to sell a particular version of history. We were there to make people think about narratives and to deconstruct them. And I genuinely believe that this, that critical thinking is essential to science. Mm. And as soon as I became aware that here was um, a solution being presented to a particular narrative of what the problem was without an alternative, I thought that doesn't sound scientific to me. It doesn't sound legal to me and it doesn't sound useful to me because in even if someone genuinely believes we have to force everybody into uh, breaching their medical privacy undergoing a treatment that they don't want how do we know that the damage that is caused by overriding people's own decision-making 
um, self, that that is not going to cause trauma. I mean, the whole point around becoming more progressive in the way that we are as a society is that we stop imposing, um, how can I say, regimes or reg regimentations on others from that Western point of view of superior scientific knowledge. Mm. And at the end of the day, if it can't be questioned, there's something wrong with it. If it's yeah. that good, it should be able to withstand all the questioning in the world and come up on its own merits. Yeah. That's, I yeah. think, Thank you. what yeah. I felt really strongly, yeah. So mm. you'd enter into uh, a friendship with initially Mandy and Angie to start with. Mm -hmm. And you, what happened then? So Angie um, and Mandy, in their very gentle and softly spoken manner, um, informed me that something really shocking was going on at work. And I've been around artistic circles all my life. I'm really interested in Aboriginal communities. I'm really interested in art that's tied to culture. And so my ears pricked up and I thought, I actually thought that this would be the one place that would be spared, that would be respected. You know, if nobody else is being respected, given the talk for decades about reconciliation and all the virtue signaling, um, coming from the white, you know, from the Western community, I thought they would stop short of coercing or harassing, uh, you know, an Aboriginal arts cooperative because we always say that's what we want more of. And so my ears pricked up and then um, Angie said, I could sense the trauma. They were in a state of shock, both Angie and Mandy. That's before I even heard about Eric. And then um, Angie asked me for, um, basically paralegal support, which is what I had been doing. Mm. And I read the first letter from Kayla Arts and it was so aggressive, the language, that I felt it in my gut. You know, when your stomach tightens mm. and your heartbeat goes up because the, the, the violence in that tone of correspondence was palpable. Mm. Yeah. So what was the, mm. yeah, where, where, where did this lead? So you, you... Well, I read the first letter and basically at that point, um, all three, and I ended up then helping all three with correspondence, wanted to make it work. So they were getting these letters um, that were clearly misinterpreting the public health directions. So instead of understanding that public health directions do not override existing legislation, mm -hmm. it's really important to understand that. Uh, they are not actually a law and they're not legislation. They are a, a direction which is being made under in Victoria under the Public Health and Wellbeing Act 2008, I think. I'd have to check on that date. So um, basically the, the, the letter, instead of saying, well, uh, at this stage you can't access the work site and what might be done to facilitate that or to work it out, instead um, the correspondence communicated you must be vaccinated, which is actually an illegal statement to make because it is illegal to coerce someone and directly order them to undergo a medical procedure they don't want. Mm. And so, but they wanted to work with the board very genuinely. And so we wrote several letters with my, under my kind of paralegal um, guidance mm -hmm. to actually point out to the board that their interpretation was likely unlawful and why it was likely unlawful and and then to make a series of suggestions about how how the board could comply with the public health directions so there's no incitement to break the law whatsoever but at the same time not uh, threaten people or discipline them or remove them from their livelihood or sack them mm. so that's what we tried to do initially mm. so we wrote a series of um, letters trying to point out yeah. those issues. Um, did you seek counsel with Indigenous lawyers? I wanted to. Um, we actually made an approach to a local um, service. Mm -hmm. However, they were swamped. So, mm -hmm. um, and also the, the feeling that we got, and generally, you know, at that time, I made a lot of approaches to high level law firms um, mm -hmm. that specialize in employment law. And the attitude was, we do not want to touch this. 
absolutely until I found one lawyer who has been doing incredible human rights law work. Yeah. So we, we, we thought about that. The Aboriginal Health Service was utterly under-resourced and not able to, to help us. Mm. And in a way, it wasn't really an Indigenous, you know, there's the added element of injustice towards people that have already suffered so much. But at the same time, the correspondence to Kayla Arts was yeah. the same correspondence being done by multinational corporations to aviation staff. So, yeah. 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 Mm. And where where is that? Where are their cases now? Okay. So mm. um, the first thing we did was to apply to the Fair Work Commission. Mm -hmm under the general protections um, provisions of the Fair Work Act. Um, that's where you essentially argue that a sacking has been unlawful. Mm -hmm. And I wrote those applications and in the course of that took all of the statements from all three. But the Fair Work Commission is really um, at this stage very hamstrung, I feel. And so we went through uh, the conciliation meetings which were most disappointing um it was what, very yeah, in, in what, what way, way yeah. um oh, well just before mm. we go to the fair work commission mm. issue um i have to say that the um one of the things that i observed with the actual sackings was that it didn't matter what we put forward it didn't matter mm. how well backed up my arguments were by the work that my lawyer was doing so these were actual legal principles this wasn't just something that i pulled out of thin air mm. it was all based on templates and long, elaborate documents talking about the legal principles. It didn't matter what we put forward. It didn't matter what we suggested. Uh, it didn't matter that we talked about medical contraindications for two of the three, Mandy and Eric, mm. um, that we talked about the possibility of applying for exemptions. They disregarded all of that. And the sackings felt utterly ideological, political and uh, punitive. So um, basically that, that's what happened. And then there was a period of shock and awe. Mm -hmm. And then we went to the Fair Work Commission and to the conciliation hearings. Yeah. Mm. So you're doing a lot of the groundwork by the sounds of it. Yeah. And so um, the lawyer has actually been most generous in actually yeah. sharing um, his uh, federal court um, documentation with me. Yeah. In um, and, and so a lot of my clients, I have done, I've taken them all the way through to the Fair Work Commission. And then the Fair Work Commission, uh, well, I was threatened by lawyers for Kayla Arts um, for just even representing um, Angie and Mandy. And then they tried to uh, stop me representing Eric. And so at that point, what I handed over. What sorry, did they threaten you with? Um, with cost oh. orders. So that's the. So this yeah. is one of the main mechanisms of um, suppression which is that anyone who dares to um, go to court with any of these cases, um, there is an absolute machinery of law firms for the corporations, or in this case, um, it's a fairly posh law firm that represented Kayala Arts. Mm -hmm. And so their first line of defense is always, don't care why you're representing, what arguments you're putting forward. If you continue with this, we will apply to have um, a cost order made against you. Meaning that cost order means that I, as a paid or unpaid representative, would have to pay the costs of Kayla Arts lawyers or any anyone else that I represent. Wow. Yeah. So that so. is threatening. It's very threatening. And mm. the degree of vitriol, even in the conciliation um, hearings that I did represent, uh, Mandy and Angie, mm. Um, the more I got, I actually got them backed into a corner with fairly intra-controvertible legal arguments, the angrier they got. Mm. Yeah. And the more, the more personal, the ins there, there was actually personal insults and condescension directed to me because I'm not a lawyer. Mm. Yeah. Does the pandemic bill in Victoria override these general, uh, health mm. sovereignty or body sovereignty laws? Well, so the, the, this is, yeah, it's fairly multi-layered and, and you mm -hmm. will, you know, I think um, a law expert expert can probably answer this far more completely and far more technically than I can. However, mm -hmm. my understanding is, and from the analysis that uh, my lawyer has undertaken, that essentially there is federal legislation 
such as uh, anti-discrimination legislation, Equal Opportunity Act, um, Privacy Principles, uh, the Privacy Act, etc. And all of that federal legislation has not been repealed or made to go away mm. by any of the public health directions that are issued under a state of emergency. So I think mm. most people don't even understand that the only way that these treatments have been able to be mandated or rolled out at all whilst under provisional approval by the TGA mm. has been because of the state of emergency, which mm. um, which enables the mandates to be made. A mandate mm. is just something that the minister says. And uh, so he has the power to say those things. However, and this is the key point, doesn't matter about the pandemic legislation. The pandemic legislation, from my understanding, basically enables the Victorian government to expand or to lengthen the state of emergency three months at a time, plus a lot of stuff around that. But again, it doesn't change the fact that um, that the, uh, the federal legislation exists and that when an employer or anyone implements the public health directions, mm. They have to do that in a way that doesn't contravene the existing um, privacy laws and the existing um, legislation that protects people against discrimination. So it's not as simple as public health direction says you can't enter the work site if you haven't provided proof of your vaccination. And then the employer makes out of that you must be vaccinated. It's, it, that is a very, very big jump. Yeah. So in the middle of that, the employer ultimately becomes, in my estimation, in the estimation of my lawyer, becomes liable if they have implemented this in a way that can be proven to have run counter to federal legislation. Mm. So the Victorian, well, not the, Victorian, the, the state governments have in a way, in my view, dropped employers into it because it's the employers that have had to go and wildly interpret the meaning of these public health directions and they may very well have made themselves liable. The problem is then for people to have the resources yeah. to bring this to a court of law to actually be sorted out. Mm. And I think they've also relied, there's been a reliance upon this idea that the vast majority of people impacted by the mandates have neither the confidence nor the resources to fight for their rights and to have it be brought to the attention of the courts, what's going on. Hence why there's been so much pushback, because if you and your lawyer mm. representing Angie, Mandy and Eric mm -hmm. uh, win, mm -hmm. there is a potential floodgate there. Yes, uh, flow on effect. Flow on effect. Yep. And Absolutely. so what sounds like, like very um, severe Mm -hmm. resistance very severe to your representation yeah. very severe resistance and it's been utterly frightening to be honest it's been mm -hmm. frightening when you get a lawyer's letter uh that threatens you with this and threatens you with a cost order and threatens you and you think well all i've actually tried to do is give a voice to people who would not classically be able to go to a court of law and say hey my rights have been breached and have been contravened against. Um, and then to be threatened with that um, and not understand, not really knowing because I'm not a lawyer that's familiar with these types of threats. Um, you know, I haven't known whether I could be made bankrupt or I could be punished in ways that um, I can't defend against. Mm. So it's taken a huge toll on my physical and emotional health as well. Yeah, I can imagine. Mm -hmm. A barrister once uh, gave me some advice uh, <laughs> about a local government issue that I was involved in with a, a huge number of people. Um, and he said that you, you change culture, you change the culture, you change the legal framework, you change the politic mm -hmm. through stories, through telling mm. stories that what his experience as a barrister is that people will work for years and years and years uh, to fight something or find a loophole in something mm -hmm. and win. And then, so they win that. And then overnight, after all that mm. fatigue, all that uh, illness and all that expense, mm -hmm. they'll uh, just switch and turn 
uh, change change the law so that can never happen again. Mm. But where you win these things mm -hmm. is when people start paying attention to the story. Yeah, and that I think one of the things that's really I I I am so uh, admiring in listening to the tenacity of your fight. And uh, and I think what where the accompaniment needs to be mm. is more people speaking out, yep. speaking the story of discrimination yep. and not just those of us inside the segregated class, but mm -hmm. actually reaching out to those who for, are on the big spectrum of, uh, of, of medical mm -hmm. opinions and, mm -hmm. me and me medical... Of which there are many. Yeah, of which there yeah. are many. Um, that that the discrimination is actually seen because I yeah. feel like without it seen, mm -hmm. that w without acknowledgement. Yeah. Um, visibility. It, visibility, exactly. Particularly with Mandy and Eric having gone through generational discrimination. Absolutely. But your story too, coming from Germany and mm -hmm. your partner from Germany. And when, when, People have been offended that mm. there is any parallel to Nazi Germany. They're, they're often thinking about later. Concentration camps. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Whereas they're not actually looking at the beginning of the war and the state of emergency powers that Hitler brought in to start really... Being able to enact. Yeah, excluding people from swimming pools, That's from right. public libraries, yep. from not being able to economically participate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel that there is this, that there is a unconscious archetypal uh, impulse in this, which is that when a society experiences great stress, and I mean, I've observed that in my historical studies, I, I, I appear to see a pattern. When there is great stress, there is this impulse to find the guilty party, to pin the enormous fears and distress that a people is experiencing onto something tangible. And I feel that this is something that is common to societies. You know, I mean, Germany, after the First World War, with an incredibly, with the economy utterly in tatters, incredible suffering, incredible losses. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly a society that becomes ripe for the picking when a party comes along with a Machiavellian capacity mm -hmm. for manipulating that and for saying the problem is not with the elites, it's not with the capitalists, it's not with the industrialists, it's not with whoever may actually have caused the war in the first place for their own imperialist interests. Mm. It's with those people over there that we now declare subhuman. And if we get that under control, all will be well. Mm. And to be honest, I mean, clearly I'm not making a comparison with the Holocaust, but I see an impulse that has resonance mm. that to me was like a thunderclap when I saw a story on a very well-known news broadcaster that said how to break up with the unvaccinated, how to remove the unvaccinated from your life. Mm. It just hit me at a cellular level that this was not good and that this had an incredibly nasty, vilifying aspect to it. Same on a well-known university's website that said the unvaccinated put people's lives at risk, point blank. No nuance, no scientific discussion. Doesn't that incite vilification towards people? You know, I was thinking of pregnant women who were contraindicated. Are they putting people's lives at risk because they cannot be vaccinated? They, they you know, even, even Pfizer or Moderna or whoever said these people can't be vaccinated, but yet we were making no nuance or context around that and suddenly pointing the finger and saying, you, you are the guilty party. You are the diseased part of our society without any basis in fact or science whatsoever. And that frightened me. Discrimination and vilification and incitement of hatred um, towards others, towards a group of any kind is wrong, whether it's in Nazi Germany or it's in Australia of the 21st century, in my view. Mm. What do you hope for um, with this particular case? Well, the case is being argued really grounded in legal principles of breach of contract, um, privacy principles that you cannot uh, use coercion to demand production of private medical information. I hope it becomes a landmark case 
where um, they win and that it's found that their dismissal was unlawful, it wasn't implemented correctly, yeah. and that um, they receive uh, a payout that is commensurate to the immense suffering, especially in terms of Eric's health, which has suffered, I mean, but in terms of all of their suffering, mm. that will compensate them, help with them getting the medical care that they need, mm. and for them to build a new arts gallery that is devoid of the structural abuse of power that they've experienced. So which is effectively the restoration of basic human rights? I think so, yes. I think you could call it that. So this isn't just an issue regarding unvaccinated people. No. This is actually a whole societal issue. Absolutely. It, and this is what makes me sad, is that um, I think a lot of people who have decided to take the vaccination have felt that uh, people who are advocating uh, caution or for choice, that those people want to have a go at them and that they don't, you know, but this is not an argument about the pros and cons of vaccination treatments. And I would love for vaccinated people to realise that this is a matter of human rights and the ability to choose because one day in the future, if, if this is let to pass, and these mandates go through unchallenged and this becomes written into the way of doing business in Australia, which is that at any time of a government's or an employer's choosing, any kind of medical treatment can be mandated uh, and can be inserted into a, a legal employment contract without consent by the employee. That subverts uh, all notions of citizenship, of legal rights and of established labor legislation in Australia, and that will become a problem because it means that corporations now set the agenda for public health policy and not the sovereign democratic government with all its legislation of a given place that determines whether or not something can be implemented and how it needs to be implemented. So I want vaccinated people to realise it's also about their choice because one day something might be mandated that they don't want. And it may not be medical. It may not be medical. It, it mm. may be any number of things. And so I think people need to realise that it's about civil rights. It's about human rights. Mm. Not about whether or not um, vaccines as a whole are a reasonable proposition. Mm. That's well, a medical argument. Yeah. Out of all suffering, there are gifts, there are learning. And mm -hmm. what are some of those learnings and gifts for you? Well, um, there have been many. Um, I feel that I have become more independent in my thinking. So um, I've learned to stick up for what I believe is the correct argument or the correct approach, even if my mentors at university have a completely different view. So as a doctoral student, we have a very parental relationship with our supervisors and, um, you know, they're our mentors and I still very much appreciate and love them. But at the same time, I've realised that I can rely upon my own mind and that's not always a given. I feel that, you know, as a woman in academia, it's still a very masculine space uh, in many ways that hasn't, you know, changed uh, that much. Mm -hmm. And so I feel that, you know, I've become aware that as a woman, I have, I had taken on a persona of sometimes intellectual sub subservience um, and that I'm coming out of that. So I'm learning that uh, I do have thought to contribute and mm -hmm. that that's okay. And uh, that was really, really important step for me. Um, and then also the connections that I've made with incredible people, such as Angie, Mandy, Eric, many, many others across Australia. So I've actually represented people across Australia in Alice Springs, mm. in Sydney, uh, in Brisbane. And I suddenly have realised how many wonderful, strong, upstanding people are out there who are all human rights advocates and had no idea that they were because mm. they'd never articulated it. Mm. 
engineers, pilots, flight attendants, uh, women's shelter workers, uh, people working for the police force, who've suddenly gone, this doesn't gel with me mm. and I'm going to advocate and I'm going to do so even under the most dire of threat to my livelihood. And to see that and to go, wow, you guys are amazing. And somehow I'm now in a community with you has kind of been really life-saving. Yeah. So that's incredibly positive. And I think many, many people will come out of this stronger and maybe even change career paths mm. and do something that's more community minded because they're good at it. Mm. And they actually know more than the city slickers, you know, like the, the established elite about the lived experience of what it is to be a human being in a community. And I think um, because, yeah, Australia has tended to have a very, you know, tall poppy syndrome, I would say, mm -hmm. where we defer to, you know, the lawyers and the judges and the academics up there. Mm -hmm. And we're just over here. And what I've actually realised, it's the people, normal, everyday people that are more human rights advocates than everybody else. And they're the ones that we need to listen to, I mm. think. Yeah, I love people. So <laughs> it's awesome Thanks, to see Anna. them come out. Yeah. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. You're very welcome.